24. Vito watched from his study window as the last of the reporters, a couple of fat men in cheap suits with press credentials stuck in their hatbands, disappeared into an old Buick and drove off slowly down Hughes Avenue. Behind them, a trio of detectives were bantering with Hubble and Mitzner, two Ivy League-educated lawyers and his employee. For hours, his home had been crowded with cops and lawyers, while out on the street, a mob of wire service and radio reporters harassed everyone who came near his building, including his neighbors. Now, alone in his darkened study, standing unseen at the window as evening approached, his arm in a sling, Vito waited for the last of the strangers to leave. Downstairs, his men also waited. They were in the kitchen with Clemenza, who had cooked a meal of spaghetti and meatballs for everyone, while Carmela went back and forth between the children's bedrooms, comforting them. Vito ran the fingers of his good hand through his hair again and again, sometimes watching the street, sometimes looking at his own reflection in the dark glass of the window, his thoughts skittering back to the parade, and the police, and the hospital, to his children sprawled on the street with bullets flying around them to Santino at his side, wielding a gun, and again and again to the moment he first spotted the dead child on the sidewalk, blood spilling over the curb and pooling on the street. About the child, he could do nothing. He would find a way to help the family, but he knew that was nothing, that only somehow undoing what had been done would be meaningful, and because he understood the limits of what was possible, he knew he would have to put the child out of mind. But for now, he let himself see the image again. He let himself see the dead child on the sidewalk bleeding into the street. He let himself remember Richie Gatto falling into his arms. And he let himself recall the indignities he suffered at the hands of the police, being handcuffed and carried away in a paddy wagon when he should have been taken directly to a hospital. He'd been shot in the shoulder. He'd been told the boy, Santino's friend Bobby Corcoran, had shot him though he hadn't seen it happen. He had, though, seen the look in the eyes of the police who dragged him away. He'd seen their disgust at the sight of him, as if they were dealing with a savage. He'd said to one of the cops, I was marching in a parade with my family, as if to explain himself. And then he blushed at the disgrace of explaining himself to some buffone, and was quiet and suffered the pain in his shoulder until Mitzner showed up and had him taken to Columbia Presbyterian, where they pulled a bullet out of him wrapped his chest in gauze, put his arm in a sling, and sent him home to be pressed and mobbed by reporters before he could escape into his house and the quiet of his study. In the window glass, he saw that he had made a mess of his hair, and he wondered at the strangeness of the image looking back at him. A middle-aged man in an unbuttoned dress shirt, his chest wrapped in gauze, his hair a mess, his left arm in a sling. He straightened out his hair as best he could. He buttoned up his shirt. His own children, he thought. His own children on the street in the midst of a gun battle. His wife sprawled on the ground, trying to protect her children from men with guns. Infamita, he whispered, and the single word seemed to fill up his study. Infamita, he said again, and only when he was aware of his heart pounding and blood rushing to his face did he close his eyes and empty his head until he felt the return of a familiar calm. He didn't say it. He didn't even think it. But he knew it in his bones and in his blood. He would do whatever had to be done. He would do it to the best of his abilities. And he would trust that God understood the things that men were forced to do, for themselves and for their families, in the world he had created. By the time Clemenza knocked twice before opening the study door, Vito was himself again. He turned on the lamp and took his seat behind the desk as Sonny, Tessio, and Jenko followed Clemenza into the room and pulled up chairs around him. At a glance, Vito saw that Jenko and Tessio were shaken. Clemenza looked no different now, after a massacre that had left a child and three of their own men dead, than he did after a Sunday dinner with friends. But in Tessio and Jenko's faces, Vito saw tightness and distress and something more, a subtle deepening of their features. In Santino, Vito found a mixture of solemnity and anger that he couldn't read, and he wondered if he might be more Clemenza's son than his own. Are they all gone? he asked. 
the detectives, the reporters. Pack of jackals, Cormenza said, the whole lot of them. He fussed with a red gravy stain on his tie and then loosened the knot. They should all go to hell, Jenko said. This is the biggest story since the Lindbergh kidnapping. That dead kid. He pressed his hands together as if praying. It's all over the newspapers and the radio. It'll be on the March of Time on Friday, I heard. Madre Dio, he added, as if offering up a prayer. Vito stood and put his hand on Jenko's back, and then patted his shoulder before he crossed the room and sat down again in the window seat. How many were killed? He asked Jenko. Besides our men and the Irish. Four dead, including the kid. Sonny answered for Jenko. And a dozen wounded. That's what's in the mirror. They got a picture of the dead kid on the front page. LaGuardia was on the radio with his throw the bums out garbage again. Clemenza brushed at the gravy stain on his tie. And then, as if more frustrated with the tie than with the news, he undid the knot, pulled off the tie, and stuffed it in his jacket pocket. To Jenko, Vito said, For the child and his family. This is business, Tessio said to Sonny. Sit down and listen. When Jimmy left and closed the door, Sonny said, Let me frisk him again. He's in our home, Pop. Which is why you don't have to frisk him, Vito said. He took his seat again behind his desk. Clemenza finished explaining for Vito. There are things that are understood in our business, Sonny. A man like Emilio, he wouldn't come into your home with murder in his heart. At Clemenza's words, Vito made a noise that came out as something between a grunt and a snarl, a sound so unusual coming from Vito that everyone turned to look at him. When Vito didn't say anything, Tessio broke the silence by addressing Clemenza. It's good to trust, he said, repeating an old Sicilian adage. It's better not to. Clemenza smiled at that. All right, he said. Let's just say I trust that Jimmy frisked him. When Mancini knocked once and opened the door, all the men in the room were seated. No one stood when Emilio entered the study. He held his hat in one hand and the other hand dangled at his side. His dark hair was carefully combed, pushed up off his forehead. A whiff of cologne entered the room with him, a scent almost flowery. Don Corleone, he said, and he moved closer to Vito's desk. The men had shifted in their chairs, two on each side of Vito, so that they formed a small audience, with Vito stage front and Emilio addressing him from the aisle. I've come to talk business, Emilio said. But first I want to offer my condolences for the men you lost today, especially Richie Gatto, who I know was close to you and who I too have known and respected for many years. You're offering condolences, Sonny said. What do you think? You think this makes us weak now? Sonny looked like he was about to say more before Clemenza laid a heavy hand on his shoulder and squeezed. Emilio never as much as glanced at Sonny. Looking at Vito, he said, I'm willing to bet Don Corleone understands why I'm here. From behind his desk, Vito watched in silence until he saw the slightest hint of sweat along Emilio's upper lip. He grasped the armrest on his chair and leaned back. You're here because Giuseppe Mariposa was behind this massacre, he said. And now that he has failed again, you see which way this war will go, and you want to save yourself and your family. Emilio nodded once, slowly, a slight bow of his head. I knew you would understand. It doesn't take a genius, Vito said. The Irish would have never tried something like this without Mariposa's backing. Sonny's face had gone from ruddy to bright red, and he looked so close to leaping for Emilio's throat that Vito interceded. Santino, he said. We invited Signor Balzini into our home, and now we will listen to what he has to say. When Sonny muttered something under his breath and fell back in his seat, Vito turned again to Emilio. Emilio looked around the study until his eyes fell on a folding chair leaning against the wall. When no one took him up on his obvious request to be seated, he continued on his feet. 
I was against this, Don Corleone, he said. I plead with you to believe me. I was against this, and so were the Rosados, but you know Giuseppe. When he gets mule-headed about a thing, there's no stopping him. But you were against this, Vito said, employing the Irish to do this dirty work, this massacre. Joe is a powerful man now. Emilio gave away his nervousness only in the way he occasionally tapped his hat against his leg. We couldn't stop him any more than one of your captains could overrule your commands. But you were opposed to it, Vito repeated. We argued against it, Emilio said, the brim of his hat bent in his grip. But to no avail. And now, this bloodbath that will bring the cops down on all of us like we've never seen before. Already they're raiding our banks and going after Tatalia's girls. Oh, Banks, Vito said almost in a whisper. The Talia's girls. He paused and let his gaze settle heavily on Emilio. This upsets you, but not an innocent child murdered. Not my family, he said, his voice rising on the word family, cowering in the street. My wife, my six-year-old daughter, my boys in the street? This is not why you're here in my home. Don Corleone, Emilio said, his head bowed, his voice full of emotion. Don Corleone, he repeated. Forgive me for allowing this to happen. Mi dispiace, Davero. Mi vergogno. I should have come to you to prevent it. I should have risked my life and my fortune. I beg your forgiveness. See, si, Vito said. And in return for this, Vito asked, a fair division of all of Joe's businesses between your family and our families. When Vito didn't respond immediately, Emilio continued, What happened today was terrible. Disgrazia. We must wipe ourselves clean of it and get back to operating peacefully without all this bloodshed. On that we agree, Vito said. But on the division of Giuseppe's businesses, we will need to talk. Yes, certainly, Emilio said with obvious relief. You're known as a man who is always fair, Don Corleone. I'm prepared to make this agreement here and now on behalf of myself and the Rosados and Tomasino Cinquemani. He stepped closer to the desk and offered Vito his hand. Vito stood and shook hands with Emilio. Jenko will come to see you soon, and he'll make the arrangements. He came around the desk and put his hand on Emilio's back, guiding him out of the study just as the door opened and Luca Brazzi stepped into the room. He had on a new shirt and tie, but otherwise the same suit he had worn at the parade. The only evidence of the gun battle was a slight rip in his trousers. Emilio blanched and looked at Vito and then back to Luca. I was told that you were among the dead. He sounded more angry than shocked. I can't be killed, Luca said. He glanced at Emilio and then walked away, as if the man's presence held no interest to him. He leaned against the wall next to the window seat. When he saw that everyone was still looking at him, he added, I've made a deal with the devil, and smiled crookedly, the left side of his face hardly moving. Vito guided Barzini to the study door and then waved for all the others in the room to leave along with Emilio. Give me a moment alone with my bodyguard, he said. Per piacere. When the last of the men had left the study, Vito went to Luca and stood next to him at the window. How is it that a man takes a bullet close up from a cannon and now stands here in my study? Luca smiled his crooked smile. You don't believe. I made a deal with the devil. Vito touched Luca's chest and felt the bulletproof vest under his shirt. I didn't think one of these could stop a high-caliber boy. Most of them can't, Luca said, and he unbuttoned his shirt to reveal a thick leather vest. Most of them are just a lot of cotton. He took Vito's hand and pressed it against the leather. Feel that? What is it? Vito asked. 
he felt layers of something solid under the leather. I had it made special, steel scales, wrapped in cotton, inside leather. Weighs a ton, but nothing I can't carry. It could stop a hand grenade. Vito touched the left side of Luca's face with the palm of his hand. What do the doctors say about this? Cork waited downstairs in the narrow room behind the bakery and off the alley as Eileen put Caitlin to sleep for the night. He stretched out on the cot and got up again and stretched out again and got up again and then paced the room a while before he sat down on the cot and fiddled with a radio on the nightstand. He found a boxing match and listened to it for a few minutes and then turned the big tuner knob and watched a black band slide along an array of numbers until he came to the Guy Lombardo show and he listened a minute to Burns and Allen as Gracie went on about her lost brother. And then he turned off the radio and got up and went to one of the two ancient bookcases and tried to pick out a title to read, but he couldn't hold three words together in his mind for more than a second. Finally, he sat down on the cot again and put his head in his hands. Eileen had insisted on him staying in this room behind the bakery until she could find Sonny and talk to him. She was right. It was a good idea. He didn't want to put her and Caitlin in danger. He should probably be hiding out someplace else altogether, but he didn't know where to go. He kept turning over the facts, rethinking and reviewing. He had shot Vito Corleone. There was no doubt about that. But he'd been aiming for Dwyer, trying to save Vito from taking a bullet in the back of the head. And even though he had accidentally hit Vito, he'd probably saved his life anyway, since Dwyer's bullet missed its mark and it probably wouldn't have if Vito hadn't been hit and dropped to the ground. Probably Dwyer would have hit him and killed him. So, as unbelievable as it sounded, he had probably saved Vito's life by shooting him. Even if no one else in the world could be expected to believe this, Cork felt that Sonny would. Sonny knew him too well. They were as much family as friends. Sonny had to know it wasn't possible that he, that Bobby Corcoran, would take a shot at Vito. He had to know it. And all Cork had to do was explain the whole thing, how he'd come to the parade after seeing Mrs. O'Rourke, how he'd come there out of concern for him, for Sonny and his family, how he'd seen Dwyer sneaking up behind Vito and had tried to save him. The facts made sense when you pieced them together, and he knew Sonny would see the whole picture. And then he had to bet that Sonny could convince the rest of his family, and after that, everything would be Jake, and he could go on with his life with Eileen and Caitlin in the bakery. He might even expect some thanks from the Corleones for what he tried to do, how he tried to help. No one ever said he was a crack shot. Jay Sook Christie, he tried to help is all. Upstairs, he heard the back door open and close, and Eileen's footsteps on the stairs. And then she opened the door and found him still with his head in his hands, sitting on the edge of the cot. Look at you, she said, and she paused in the doorway with her hands on her hips. You're a sight, aren't you? with your hair all disheveled and looking like the weight of the world is on your shoulders. Cork straightened out his hair. I'm sitting here, and I'm thinking, Bobby Corcoran, did you really shoot Vito Corleone? And the answer keeps coming back, yes, you did, Mr. Corcoran. You put a bullet in this shoulder in plain sight of dozens, including Sonny. Eileen sat beside Cork and put a hand on his knee. Oh, Bobby, she said and then was quiet as her eyes moved over the rows of titles stuffed into the pair of bookcases across from her. She smoothed her dress down over her knees and reached under her hair to squeeze an earlobe between her thumb and forefinger. Ah, Bubby, what? Cork said. He took his hands away from his face and looked at his sister. What is it you're wanting to say to me, Eileen? Did you know that a little boy was killed in all the shooting? Child just Caitlin's age. I did, Bobby said. I saw him lying there in the street. It wasn't me that shot him. I didn't mean to say it was you that shot that child, Eileen said, and in her voice still there was a note of chastisement. Oh, for God's sake, Eileen, I went there to help Sonny. You even said to go. I didn't say to take a gun with you. I didn't say to go there armed. Oh, mother of God, Bobby said, 
and again he held his head in his hands. Hylene, he said into his palms, unless I can explain to Sonny what happened, I'm a dead man. I shot Vito Corleone. I didn't mean to. Clemenza grasped Sonny's lapel and pulled him close. Five minutes, he said. Capiche? Take any longer, I'll come get you myself. They were in the back seat of Clemenza's Buick, Jimmy Mancini and Al Hats in the front, Jimmy at the wheel. They'd just pulled up to Sandra's building, where Sandra was waiting, watching from her window. As soon as Jimmy had pulled the big Buick over to the curb, Sandra disappeared from the window, leaping up and hurrying out of sight. Five minutes, Clemenza repeated, as Sonny grunted an affirmation and threw open his door. Go ahead, Clemenza said to Jimmy, tapping him on the shoulder. Jimmy cut the engine and joined Hats, who was already out of the car, following Sonny toward Sandra's stoop. Que cazzo, Sonny spun around and threw up his hands. Wait in the car, I'll be two minutes. No can do, Jimmy said, and he nodded toward the top of the steps, where Sandra had appeared in the doorway, holding a hand over her heart, looking down at Sonny as if he might be in grave danger. We'll wait here, Jimmy said, and he and Al turned their backs to the doorway and took up positions side by side at the bottom of the stairs. Sonny looked once to Clemenza, who was frowning at him from the back seat, his hands folded over his belly, and then he muttered a curse under his breath and hurried up the steps. Sandra threw her arms around his neck and squeezed so violently that she almost knocked him over. Dollface, Sonny said as he peeled her arms off his neck. I gotta hurry, I wanted to tell you, he added, stepping back and grasping her by the shoulders. I may not be able to see you till all this parade stuff is over with. He gave her a brief, passionless kiss on the lips. But I'm all right, he said. Everything's going to be all right. Sonny. Sandra started to speak and then stopped. She looked as though she might dissolve in tears if she tried to say another word. Dollface, Sonny said again. I promise. This will all blow over pretty soon. How soon? Sandra managed. She wiped away tears. What's going on, Sonny? It's nothing, Sonny said and then caught himself. It was a massacre what happened, he said. The cops will straighten it out. They'll get the bastards that did this, and then everything will be back to normal. I don't understand, she said, as if dismissing Sonny's explanation. The papers are saying terrible things about your family. You don't believe that crap, do you? Sonny asked. It's because we're Italian they can get away with saying that stuff about us. Sandra looked down the steps to where Jimmy and Al were standing at their posts like sentries. They each had one hand in their pockets as their eyes scanned the street. Beyond them, a gleaming black Buick waited at the curb with a fat man waiting in the back seat. In her eyes, there was a mix of recognition and surprise, as if she suddenly understood everything, but still found it hard to believe. We're businessmen, Sonny said, and sometimes our business gets rough. But this, he said, meaning the parade massacre, People are going to pay for this. Sandra nodded and was silent. I don't have time to explain everything, Sonny said, his voice turning curt and hard, before he softened and added with a touch of exasperation. Do you love me? Sandra answered without hesitation. Yes, I love you, Santino. Then trust me, he said. Nothing bad's going to happen. He stepped close and kissed her again, this time tenderly. I promise you that, okay? Nothing. 25. Sonny pushed the door open and stuck his head into a dark room. He was in their soon-to-be new home on Long Island, in the Walden compound that was bustling now, late at night, with cars and men moving from house to house. Between the headlights and the lights on in every room in every house and the floodlights on the courtyard and the surrounding walls, the place was lit up like Rockefeller Center. Clemenza had told Sonny that his father wanted to see him, and Sonny had gone from room to room in his father's house until he wound up the door of what he guessed was the only dark space in the compound. Pop, he said, and he took a tentative step into the shadowy room where his father's silhouette was centered in a window that looked out on the courtyard. Should I turn on the lights? He asked. 
The silhouette shook its head and stepped away from the window. Close the door, it said, in a voice that seemed to come from someplace far away. Clemenza said you wanted to see me. Sonny closed the door and moved through the shadows to his father, who pulled a pair of chairs together with his good arm. His left arm hung useless in a sling over his chest. Sit down. Vito took a seat and gestured to the chair across from him. I want to talk to you alone a moment. Sure, Pop. Sonny took his seat, folded his hands in his lap, and waited. In a minute, Vito said, his voice not much more than a whisper. Clemenza will join us, but I wanted to have a word with you first. He leaned forward and hung his head and ran the fingers of his right hand through his hair, and then held his head in his hands. Sonny had never seen his father like this, and an impulse rushed up to touch him, to lay a hand on his father's knee in comfort. It was an impulse he didn't act on, but would recall often in the future. This moment with his father, in his shadowy, unfurnished study, when he wanted to reach out and comfort him. Santino, Vito said, and he sat up. Let me ask you, and I want you to take a moment to consider this. Why do you think Emilio came to us? Why is he betraying Giuseppe Mariposa? In his father's eyes, Sonny read a note of hopefulness as if Vito deeply wanted him to get this answer right, and so Sonny tried to think about the question. But he came up with nothing, a blank space, a refusal on his mind's part to do any thinking. I don't know, Pop, he said. I guess I'd take him at his word, what he said. He sees you'll make a better leader now than Mariposa. Vito shook his head and a little bit of hope in his eyes disappeared. It was replaced, though, with kindness. No, he said, and he laid his good hand on Sonny's knee, exactly the gesture Sonny had entertained a moment earlier. A man like Emilio Barzini, he said, can never be taken at his word. To understand the truth of things, he went on, tightening his grip on Sonny's knee. You have to judge both the man and the circumstances. You have to use both your brains and your heart. That's what it's like in a world where men lie as a matter of course. And there is no other kind of world, Santino. At least not here on Earth. So why then? Sonny asked, a note of frustration in his voice. If not what he said, then why? Because, Vito said. Emilio planned the parade shootings. He paused and watched Sonny, looking like exactly what he was, a parent explaining something to his child. He didn't plan for it to turn into the massacre that it did, and that was his mistake, he continued. But you can be sure that this was Emilio's plan. Mariposa was never smart enough to come up with something like this. If it had worked, if I had been killed along with Luca Brasi, then you, Sonny, killing you would have been part of the plan, too. And if this could have all been blamed on the crazy Irish, because everyone knows Italians would never endanger women and children, another man's innocent family, that this is our code. If even the other families, they believed it was the Irish, then the war would have been over and Joe would be on his way to running everything, with Emilio as his second-in-command. Vito got up and wandered to the window, where he looked out at the activity in the courtyard. With his right hand, he slipped a sling over his head and tossed it away, wincing slightly as he opened and closed the fist of his left hand. Already, he said, turning to Sonny, we see the newspapers calling it an eye. He clapped his hands over Sonny's face, gave him a shake, and let him go. What good does Emilio Barzini dead do for us? Then we're fighting Carmine Barzini and the Rosano brothers and Mariposa. When Sonny didn't answer, Vito continued. With Emilio alive and Mariposa dead, 
When we finish dividing up Mariposa's territories, there will be five families, and we'll be the strongest of the five. That's our goal. That's what we need to be thinking about. Not killing Emilio. Forgive me, Pop, Sonny said. But if we went after all of them, we could be the only family. Again, Vito said. Think. Even if we could win such a war, what happens after? The newspapers will make us out as monsters. We make bitter enemies of the relatives of the men we kill. Vito leaned into Sonny and put his hands on his shoulders. Sonny, he said. Sicilians never forget, and they never forgive. This is a truth you must always keep in mind. I want to win this war so that we can have a long peace afterward and die surrounded by our families in our own beds. I want Michael and Fredo and Tom to go into legitimate businesses so that they can be rich and prosperous. And unlike me and now you, Sonny, they won't always have to worry about who will be trying to kill them next. Do you understand, Sonny? Do you understand what it is that I want for this family? Sonny said, Yeah, Pop, I understand. Good, Vito said, and gently brushed Sonny's hair back off his forehead. When the door opened behind them, Vito touched Sonny's shoulder and pointed to the light switch by the door. Sonny turned on the lights and Clemenza entered the room. To Sonny, Vito said, There's much to do in the coming days. He touched Sonny's arm again. We must be on guard for treachery. He hesitated and appeared to be caught in a moment of indecision. I'm going to leave now, he said and glanced once towards Sonny and quickly looked away, almost as if he was afraid to meet his eyes. Treachery, he said again, softly, whispering a warning to himself, and then he raised a finger and nodded to Clemenza and Sonny, as if to emphasize the warning. Listen to Clemenza, he said to Sonny, and he left the room. What's going on? Sonny asked. Nashbet. Clemenza said, and he closed the door gently behind Vito as if being careful not to make too much noise. Sit down. He pointed to the two facing chairs where Sonny had sat a few minutes earlier with his father. Sure, Sonny said. He took a seat and crossed his legs, making himself comfortable. What's this about? Clemenza was wearing his typical baggy rumpled suit with a bright yellow tie so crisp and clean that it had to be brand new. He plopped himself down in the chair across from Sonny, grunted with the pleasure of taking the weight off his feet, and took a black pistol out of one jacket pocket and a silvery silencer out of the other. He held up the silencer. You know what this is? Sonny gave Clemenza a look. Of course he knew it was a silencer. What's this about? He asked again. Personally, I don't like silencers, Clemenza said. He went about attaching the heavy metal tube to the barrel of the gun as he spoke. I prefer a big noisy gun, he said. Better to scare anybody gets ideas. Big bang, everybody scatters, you walk away. Sonny laughed and clasped his hands behind his neck. He leaned back and waited for Clemenza to get around to whatever it was he wanted to say. Clemenza fiddled with the silencer. He was having trouble getting it attached. This is about Bobby Corcoran, he said finally. Ah, Sonny said, and he glanced behind him out the window, as if he was looking for something that he just remembered he'd lost. I can't figure it, he said when he turned back to Clemenza, and the way he said it made it sound like a question. What's there to figure? Clemenza answered. Sonny said, I don't know what the hell to think, Uncle Pete. He was immediately embarrassed at having fallen back to his childhood way of addressing Clemenza, and he tried to rush past the moment by speaking quickly. I know Bobby shot Pop, he said. I saw like everybody else, but, but you can't believe it, Clemenza said, as if he knew what Sonny was thinking. Yeah, Sonny said. It's... He looked away again, not knowing what else to say. 
Listen, Sonny, Clemenza said. And he went back to fiddling with the gun, loosening and tightening the silencer, checking that it was properly fitted to the barrel. I understand, he said, that you've grown up with this kid, Bobby. That you've known him all your life. He paused and nodded as if he had, This is a tough business. The cops, the army, he said, and he appeared to be struggling for words. Put a uniform on somebody, tell him you gotta kill this other guy because he's the bad guy, you gotta kill him. And then anybody can pull the trigger. But in this business, sometimes you gotta kill people who maybe they're your friends. He stopped and shrugged as if he were taking a moment to think about this himself. That's the way it is in this business. Sometimes maybe it's even people you love and you gotta do it. That's just the way it is, he repeated, in this business. He picked up the gun from Sonny's lap and handed it to him. It's time for you to make your bones, he said. Bobby Corcoran's got to go, and you got to be the one to do it. He shot your father, Santino. That's the long and short of it. He's got to go, and you got to do it. Sonny dropped the gun into his lap again and peered down at it as if he were looking at a mystery. When finally he picked it up, it was black and heavy in his hands, the silencer adding extra weight. He was still staring at it when he heard the door close and realized that Clemenza had left the room. He shook his head as if he refused to believe what was happening, though the gun was there in his hand, solid and heavy. Alone in the sudden quiet, he closed a fist around the butt of the gun. Fredo woke to darkness, his head buried in pillows and his knees pulled to his chest. He didn't know where he was for a minute, and then the excitement of the previous day came back to him, and he knew he was in his own bed, and he remembered the parade and that his father had been shot, but that he'd be okay. He'd seen him. Mama had let him and Michael get a peek at him before she pulled them back and sent them upstairs to their room, away from all the commotion in the house. Pop's arm was in a sling, but he looked okay. And then no one would tell him anything more about what had happened. He tried to listen at the door, but Mama was in the room with them, making them both, him and Michael, do their schoolwork and keeping them from hearing anything. They couldn't even turn on the radio, and Mama wouldn't let Michael talk about it. And then he fell asleep. Still, he knew there'd been shooting at the parade and Pop had been hit in the shoulder. As he lay in bed letting the day's events come back to him, Fredo found himself getting angry again because he'd been unlucky enough to miss the whole thing. If he'd been there, maybe he could have protected his father. Maybe he could have kept him from getting shot. He might have thrown himself over his father or knocked him out of the way of the bullet. He wished he'd been there. He wished he'd had the chance to show his father and everybody else that he wasn't just a kid. If he'd had the chance to save his father from being shot, everybody'd see. He was fifteen now. He wasn't a kid anymore. When finally Fredo turned over, pulling his head out of the pillows, he was groggy with sleep. Across the room, Michael's covers were tented over his knees and light was seeping out around the edges. Michael, what are you doing? Fredo whispered. You reading under there? Yeah. Michael's voice came back, muffled. Then he peeled the covers back and stuck his head out. I sneaked the newspaper from downstairs, he said, and he showed Fredo a copy of the mirror. On the cover was a picture of a little kid lying on the sidewalk, his arm hanging over the curb, and over the picture was the huge headline, Gangland Massacre. Holy cow, Fredo said, and leapt out of his bed and onto Michael's. What's it say? He snatched the paper and the flashlight away from Michael. Says Pop's a gangster. It says he's a big shot in the mafia. Fredo turned the page and saw a picture of his father being pushed into a paddy wagon. Pop says there's no such thing as the mafia, he said. And then he saw a picture of Richie Gatto on his face in the street, his arms and legs twisted, blood all around him. That's Richie, he said softly. Yeah, Michael said. Richie's dead. Richie's dead? Fredo said. Did you see him get shot? He asked. And then he dropped the newspaper as the bedroom door opened. What are you two doing? Carmela demanded. She came into the bedroom wearing a blue robe over a white nightgown, 
her hair unpinned and falling to her shoulders. Where did you get this? She picked up the newspaper from the bed, folded it in half, and held it to her breast as if trying to hide it. Michael snuck it up from downstairs, Fredo said. Michael gave Fredo a look and then turned to his mother and nodded. Did you read it? She asked. Michael did, Fredo said. Is Richie really dead? Carmela crossed herself and was silent, though her expression and the tears that came to her eyes were answer enough. Fredo said, But Pop's okay, right? Didn't you see him yourself? Carmela stuffed the folded newspaper into the pocket of her robe and then took Fredo by the arm and led him back to his bed. To Michael, she said, You can't believe what you read in the newspapers. Michael said, they say Pop's a big shot in the Mafia. Is that true? Mafia, Carmela said, pulling her robe tight. Everything with Italians is always the Mafia. Would a Mafia know congressmen like your father does? Michael pushed his hair off his forehead and seemed to think about this. I'm not doing my report on Congress, he said. I changed my mind. What are you talking about, Michael? All the work you've done. I'll find another subject. Michael settled himself into his bed, pulling the covers up over him. Carmela took a step back. She shook her head at Michael as if disappointed in him. She wiped tears from her eyes. I hear another sound from in here, she said to Fredo. I'll tell your father. She said it half-heartedly and then hesitated, watching her boys. When she left the room, pulling the bedroom door closed behind her, she found Tom waiting at the head of the stairs. Maron, she said, joining him. Isn't anybody sleeping tonight? 26. Luca parked on 10th Street next to the river and walked past a line of shacks with wood and various junk piled on their makeshift roofs. The night was chilly and a thin mist of smoke floated up from a crooked stovepipe sticking out of the last shack in the row. It was after two in the morning, and Luca was alone on the street. To one side of him were the shacks, and to the other, the river. He pulled his jacket tight and continued up the block, the shuffle of his footsteps the only sound other than wind over the water. When he turned the corner, Jojo and Polly were waiting outside a busted door. They leaned against a brick wall, Jojo with a cigarette dangling from his lips, Polly tapping the ash off a fat cigar. Are you sure they're in there? Luca asked when he reached the boys. They already took some shots at us, Polly said, and he stuck the cigar in his mouth. We're sitting ducks in there, Jojo added. Take a look, he gestured to the door. What is this place? Slaughterhouse. Luca snorted. Just like Mix, making their stand. In a slaughterhouse. There's only two of them. Yeah, it's the Donnellys, Polly said, the cigar still in his mouth. We chased them here, Jojo said. They figure they just gotta hold out a couple more hours, Polly chewed on his cigar. Then the workers start showing up, Jojo said, finishing Polly's thought for him. Luca peeked into the slaughterhouse. The floor was mostly empty with a web of hooks dangling over conveyor belts. Catwalks crisscrossed the building midway up the walls. Where are they? He asked. Somewhere up there, Jojo said. Poke your head in, they'll start shooting at you. You got no idea? They're moving around, Polly said. They got the advantage up there. Luca looked into the slaughterhouse again and found a ladder against the near wall that led up to the catwalks. There another way in? Other side of the building, Jojo said. Vinny's over there. Luca pulled a thirty-eight out of his shoulder holster. Go with Vinny. When you're ready, bust in firing. Don't have to aim at nothing. Don't have to hit nothing. Luca checked his gun. Just make sure you're shooting up, not across, so you don't hit me. 
You want us to keep them distracted, Jojo said. And you come at him from this side? Luca snatched the cigar out of Pauli's mouth and stubbed it out against the wall. Go on, he said to both of them. Hurry up, I'm starting to get tired. When the boys were out of sight, Luca took a second pistol from his jacket pocket and looked it over. It was a new gun, a three fifty seven Magnum with a black cylinder and long barrel. He removed the bullet from one of the chambers, popped it back in, and then looked into the slaughterhouse again. The interior of the building was dimly lit by a series of lights hanging from the ceiling. They cast a puzzle of shadows over the walls and floor. While he watched, a door on the opposite side of the building flew open and a storm of muzzle flashes sparked out of the darkness. Up on the catwalks, Luca spotted more barrel flashes coming from opposite sides of the building, and he made a dash for the ladder. He was already up on the catwalk and halfway across the space between him and a pile of crates barricading one of the Donnellys when Rick yelled from the other side of the building, warning Billy of Luca's approach. Billy managed to get off two shots, the second of which hit Luca in the chest over his heart, nearly knocking the wind out of him. It felt like a big man landing a solid punch, though it wasn't enough to bring him down, and a second later, Luca was on top of Billy knocking the gun out of his hand and wrapping his arm around his neck so that he couldn't speak or make a sound other than a panicked, guttural rumble. Luca gave himself a minute to recover as he held Billy in front of him like a shield. Billy! Rick called from across the wide space between them. Jojo and the boys had backed out onto the street. The slaughterhouse was quiet, Billy's ragged breathing the only noise other than a constant low hum coming from someplace out of sight. Your brother's okay, Luca yelled. He knocked the piled up crates aside with his free arm, sending a few tumbling to twenty or so feet to the floor below. Come on out, Rick. With the crates out of the way, he pushed Billy in front of him to the edge of the catwalk up against the railing. He had one arm around Billy's neck, the other dangling at his side, the revolver in his hand. When Rick didn't answer or show himself, he said, Jumpin' Joe wants to see you. He wants to talk to you and Billy. Ah, you're so full of shit, Rick said, you twisted freak. He spoke as if Luca was sitting across the table from him. If not for a loud note of weariness, he would have sounded amused. Luca pushed Billy against the railing, lifting him a little. Billy had relaxed a bit, and Luca loosened his grip, making it easier for the kid to breathe. Come out now, he said to Rick. Don't make me put a bullet in your little brother. On the Romero stoop, a half dozen or so men in cheap dark suits were talking to a pair of young women in cloche hats and clingy dresses inappropriate for a funeral. The girls' outfits, Sonny figured, were probably all they owned in the way of anything dressy. He had parked around the corner and had watched the block for a half hour before deciding it was safe to make an appearance at Vinny's wake. The Corleone family had sent a wreath to the funeral parlor, and Sonny had $5,000 in a fat envelope in his jacket pocket that he wanted to deliver personally, though he'd been ordered to stay away from the funerals, especially Vinny's funeral. Mariposa, according to Jenko, wasn't above snatching him at a wake. Sonny took a deep breath and felt the comforting bind of his shoulder holster. Before he reached the stoop, the two girls noticed him approaching and hurried back into the building. By the time Sonny climbed the front steps and started up a flight of stairs to the Romero's second-floor apartment, Angelo Romero and Nico Angelopoulos were waiting on the landing. In the dim light of the stairwell, Angelo's face looked as though it had aged a dozen years. His eyes were bloodshot, red around the eyelids, and surrounded by dark circles the color of bruises. He looked as though he hadn't slept since the parade. People's voices speaking in hushed tones floated down the stairs. Angelo, Sonny said, and then he was surprised by the knot in his throat that made it impossible to say anything more. He hadn't let himself think about Vinny. The fact of his death was there in his mind like a check mark. Check. Vinny's dead. There was nothing more than that, nothing he felt and nothing he'd let himself think about. As soon as he spoke Angelo's name, though, 
Something rushed up inside him and lodged in his throat, and he couldn't say anything more. You shouldn't be here. Angelo rubbed his eyes so hard he looked more like he was trying to crush them than trying to comfort himself. I'm tired, he said, and then, announcing the obvious, added, I haven't slept much. He's having dreams, Nico said. He put his hand on Angelo's shoulder. He can't sleep because of the dreams. Sonny managed to say, I'm sorry, Angelo, though he had to struggle to get the words out. Yeah, Angelo said, but you shouldn't be here. Sonny swallowed hard and looked down the stairs to the street, where the dreary and overcast day was visible through a window in the front door. He found it easier to think about business, about details. I checked things out before I came up, he said. There's nobody watching the place or anything. I'll be all right. That's not what I meant, Angelo said. I meant my family doesn't want you here, my parents. You can't come up to the wake. They won't have it. Sonny gave himself a moment to let that sink in. I brought this. He pulled the envelope out of his jacket pocket. It's something, he said, and extended the envelope to Angelo. Angelo crossed his hands over his chest and ignored the offering. I'm not coming back to work for your family, he said. Am I going to have trouble? Nah, Sonny said, and he pulled the envelope away, let his hand drop to his side. Why would you think that? He said. My father will understand. He don't mean it, Nico said once Angelo was gone. He's distraught, Sonny. You know how close they were, those two. They were like each other's shadows. Jesus, Sonny. Sure. Sonny handed the envelope to Nico. Tell him I understand he said, and tell him my family will provide whatever he and his family might need, now or in the future. You got that, Nico? He knows that, Nico said. He put the envelope in his pocket. I'll make sure they get this. Sonny patted Nico on the shoulder as a departing gesture and then started down the stairs. I'll walk with you to your car, Nico said, following him. When they were on the street, he asked, What'll happen with Bobby now? I heard he's hiding out. Sonny said, I don't know, and his tone of voice and manner said he didn't want to talk about Bobby. Listen, I wanted to tell you, Nico said, and he took Sonny by the arm and stopped him on the street. Me and Angelo were talking, and Angelo figures that Bobby must have been shooting at Stevie Dwyer, not your father. Your father don't make any sense, Sonny. You know that. Stevie Dwyer. That's what Angelo thinks. That's what Vinny thought, too. They had a chance to talk it over before Vinny got shot. Sonny scratched his head and looked toward the street as if he might somehow be able to see what happened at the parade. Stevie Dwyer, he said again. That's what Angelo says. They didn't see it, but Angelo said Stevie was behind your father, and then after Bobby shot, Luca got Stevie. I wasn't there, he said, and he shoved his hands in his pockets. But Sonny, damn, Bobby loves you and your family, and he hated Stevie. Makes sense, don't it? Sonny tried to think back to the parade. He remembered seeing Bobby take the shot at his father, and then Vito went down, and that's all he remembered. Everybody was shooting everywhere. Stevie Dwyer wound up dead. He tried to remember, but already everything that had happened at the parade and right after was a jumble. He rubbed his knuckles along his jaw. I don't know, he said. I don't know what the hell happened. I gotta talk with Bobby. It don't look good he added, that he's hiding out. Yeah, but you know, Nico said. They were nearing Sonny's car. You know Bobby wouldn't take a shot at your father. That just ain't right, he said. You know that, Sonny. I don't know what I know, Sonny stepped into the street, starting for his car. What about you, he asked, changing the subject. How do you like your job? It's a job. Nico took his hat off and blocked it as Sonny got into the car. It's hard work on the docks. That's what I hear. Sonny closed the car door and sat back in his seat. The pay's decent in the union, right? Sure, Nico said. I don't get to buy fancy clothes or anything anymore, but it's okay. 